Well, I've started uh, experimenting with uh, loops uh, in order to uh, learn about uh, mag, mag loop antennas. And this is uh, a five foot loop made of quarter inch copper tubing. And across the room there is a nine foot circumference loop. Again, of a quarter inch copper tubing. And right here is a seven foot loop made with uh, flat aluminum. It's two inches wide by an eighth of an inch thick. And uh, outside here is a uh, frame that I've made for experimenting with larger loops and I plan to use uh, coax uh, to form the loop for that. Here is a, uh, another loop I'm experimenting with. It's uh, rectangular, almost square. It's approximately four feet on each side, and it's made from uh, extruded aluminum that has a profile like this, and this is one inch on each side. So this has a total outside perimeter of six inches. So with skin effect flowing on the outside, that should be roughly equivalent to the surface of a two inch diameter round tube. Square uh, things are easy to work with. Can be, can be assembled using uh, little right angle clips. And uh, these I made by just cutting off one inch pieces from uh, an aluminum angle. So uh, that's a very easy way to assemble rectangular objects. This uh, notch at the top of the loop is where the variable capacitor will go. In the meantime, you can determine the inductance of a loop by putting a uh, known capacitor at that point and then finding the resonant frequency. Now I find the uh, resonant frequency uh, using my MFJ SWR analyzer. And I've learned uh, you're not really at the resonant frequency until you adjust your drive loop to get an exact one-to-one -one SWR. Uh, I just uh, got my nano vector network analyzer and I'll be using that in the future. As of yet, I have not learned how to use it. Now while experimenting uh, with this loop, uh, it's uh, close to a quarter wavelength uh, circumference for 10 meters. And uh, the closer you get to a quarter wavelength, the less capacitance you need for resonance. And so I got this stupid idea of just holding on two more pieces of aluminum. This is actually strips of aluminum flashing uh, with some plastic uh, clips. And uh, while making some measurements on this, I found that it's resonated in six meters, in the six meter band. And when I figured out some lengths here, uh, the total length running around the loop plus the two ears sticking up uh, is about nine feet, which is a half a wavelength on six meters. And uh, I've connected my coax to it with uh, two clip leads.
and <clears throat> by adjusting uh, where those are attached I've been able to get the SWR down to where it's almost one to one. It's hard, it's hard to read down there at the bottom. So that's maybe 1.1 to 1 or 1.05 and we're at 52.37 megahertz. So uh, let's uh, load this up and get, out, get on the air and see what it does. I put a uh, 100 watts into the loop and used a fluorescent tube to show the intense electric field. I wondered how this would uh, compare to a dipole antenna, so I strung a uh, six meter dipole across the room and put 100 watts into that. And here I had to almost touch the end of the wire to light the tube. And of course, as we move it to the center, the electric field goes down and the magnetic field goes up. Here is my uh, flat loop antenna with my uh, homemade capacitor installed. I will show you uh, how I built the capacitor in another video. For now, I adjust it manually. I'll motorize it later. Note that the drive loop is at an angle with respect to the main loop. More about this later. This building has a concrete floor and concrete block walls. My ham shack is behind that white door. I made several contacts on FT8 with this loop sitting right there. The bottom of the loop is about a meter above the floor. Here I'm transmitting 100 watts uh, with the loop and the fluorescent tube shows the electric field generated by the loop. The most uh, common way to drive uh, a loop is uh, just with a, uh, a round primary loop such as this. And the uh, typical recommendation is that the circumference of the drive loop should be about one-fifth the circumference of the main loop. And I found that's true at the lower frequencies. But when you build a multi-band mag loop antenna, uh, different amounts of coupling are needed on different bands. And as you go up in frequency, uh, the loop has to be smaller to achieve an exact one-to-one -one match. Or the loop can just be tilted uh, with respect to the plane of the main loop to get uh, less drive flux coupling. Uh, the loop can also be moved up and down uh, to get less coupling. And uh, there's several videos out there where people smash uh, their drive loop down and uh, stretch it in different directions. But if you make it circular and make it so that you can change the angle, uh, you can change the drive, like I said, to get an exact one-to-one -one match on every band. Okay, I'd uh, like to talk to you about what I've learned so far. Uh, there's still a lot of learning to do. If you are interested in uh, small loop antennas, called the mag loop antenna, uh, either to build them or even to buy one. I'd suggest uh, first you watch uh, the video that I have uh, linked below. It has a presentation by John W6NBC, uh, which is uh, definitely worth watching to learn about loops. Now, uh, 
a lot of the things you hear about loops uh, could scare you off. Uh, talk about efficiency and that everything has to be welded or silver soldered and uh, let, let's address those first. Uh, let's say uh, at some uh, frequency your mag loop is only 50% efficient. Well, that's uh, half your power's lost, that's true, but that's only 3 dB down. It's half an S unit. So, uh, because of the logarithmic nature of uh, radio, uh, it's not such a big deal. What's the efficiency of a dipole antenna? Do you worry about it? When you're off the major axis, uh, the signal can be 20 dB down from the uh, high point. But you still make contacts. So uh, the takeoff angle uh, is good with uh, mag loops, and that can make up for a lot of deficiencies. Uh, most loops that uh, you see are circular or hexagonal in shape, and uh, there's really no reason for that. If you watch that video, uh, you'll we'll see. And uh, round circular things, well, round as in conductors, like tubing, uh, bending round tubing requires special equipment. It's difficult and uh, hard to do. It's also hard to make connections to round conductors. So uh, I found it's much easier to work with rectangular or square loops. And I'll show you the source of the materials here as we go on. Now there's... Uh, well, let's get back to the welded and silver soldered. Uh, just uh, ordinary common sense. If you clean the conductors and bolt them rigidly and tightly, uh, you won't have any, connect any connection problems. And uh, one way to see if you do is to run an antenna for a while and then with the power off, feel it. Are there any hot spots? And uh, that'll tell you right away if you have bad connections. Now let's talk about uh, SWR. As I said earlier, you can get an exact one-to-one -one SWR on any band, but with a given drive loop size, uh, you can't. So most com commercial manufacturers uh, do their coupling in the middle of the uh, bands that the antenna covers. So uh, then you'll have a higher SWR at uh, lower frequencies and higher frequencies. But uh, by making your drive loop adjustable, and I've talked already about how to do that. If, you're dry, if this is the plane of your main loop and this is main, the plane of your drive loop, if you make it so you can turn it, you can adjust the coupling and get one-to-one -one SWR. Now the loop, the drive loop has to be sized at the lowest band and then the coupling can be reduced as the frequency goes up. To the higher bands. So uh, let's talk a little bit about materials. Uh, PVC is uh, great for structures. Uh, you'll see PVC pipe used a lot and you can see it's rather thick. This is Schedule 40 pipe. Uh, there's also drain pipe available but it's much thinner and much weaker. So this is a good uh, material to support uh, flexible conductors like coax. So also uh, a great material is 
Uh, this is called G10 or FR4 and this is the base material that PC boards are made out of. Uh, copper is plated on both sides to make uh, copper clad PC boards and I used this for the uh, end plates on my capacitor. So uh, the thing about both these materials is they are not good dielectrics at RF frequencies. And I discovered this by uh, trying to make capacitors out of copper clad board. The, at first I thought it was the copper that was heating, but that's not the case. It was actually the dielectric material, the G10, uh, that was generating heat. And I've also tried using flat sheets of PVC. Same deal, they get hot. And uh, I don't know how the uh, trombone type capacitors work where people are using PVC pipe, but that could be a, a waste of energy there. So uh, let me show you a good source for square and rectangular conductors, PVC and uh, the G10. This is the uh, McMaster car website. It's uh, McMaster.com and let's uh, look for aluminum extrusions. And you can see they have quite a lot here. Uh, what we want is the 6063 aluminum, which is down here. They call it architectural aluminum. And uh, let's click on that. And here's the uh, it's listed by the wall thickness and then the the height and the width. So what I showed you uh, that I used for my uh, forefoot on a side loop was 1 16th inch wall, 1 inch by 1 inch, which is down here. And uh, right here is the prices. If we go to the top of the column, this column is four foot lengths and this column is eight foot lengths. So it's a little cheaper to get uh, the eight foot lengths and cut it in half. Now you will have to pay for shipping, uh, but McMaster has locations in five major cities in the U.S. That's Atlanta, Chicago, Cleveland, Los Angeles, and Princeton, New Jersey. So uh, it won't have to be shipped too far usually. If you're close enough, you can just go there and pick it up. Now let's uh, look look at aluminum sheets. And in this case, we want the 6061 aluminum because it's stiff. Now I, I'm talking about uh, for making uh, capacitor plates. And here's various sizes. Oh, the way I bought it was 12 by 24. Right here. And for my capacitor, I used 032 thickness. I'd suggest a little heavier than that. Uh, it, it'll uh, 
be easier to keep it flat. So, uh, and of course, here's the price here for a 12 by 24 sheet. And I cut mine out with a uh, bandsaw. And I've seen people also use a, a jigsaw with a metal blade. Now let's uh, look at G10. And th this is it right here. And they actually have it in, in different colors. Yellow is the standard color that uh, is often used in circuit boards. They also have black and blue and tan. So, and uh, I bought mine in the 12 by 24 inch size. So right here's what I bought. And uh, typical circuit boards are a 16th of an inch thick. So that'll give you an idea of the stiffness of this stuff. And of course, you, you can see an eighth of an inch and a quarter inch if you are looking for really, really strong structures. But this is the material I used for the end plates, which are the main frame of uh, the variable capacitor. Now let's uh, look at circuit boards in case you're into making things out of circuit board material. They have the uh, typical perforated uh, circuit boards, uh, but typically you can get these cheaper other places. But here's just bare copper clad board, and uh, they have single sided and double sided. And the smaller sizes, again, you can probably get cheaper somewhere else. But uh, you can see, you can get it from McMaster, like here, 12 by 18 inches and 36 by 24 inches. And in terms of cost per square inch, uh, this is pretty cheap if you have a way of cutting it up into smaller boards, like a, a foot shear or something like that. And here's the double-sided board. So they have uh, some unusual stuff here. If uh, you happen to know of a good source of uh, the type of materials discussed in this video, uh, please let us know in a comment. Uh, that'll help uh, a lot of people uh, that are uh, wanting to build a mag loop antenna. And if you're a supplier of some of these materials and think you are a good source for them, uh, leave us uh, information in, in the comment section. Uh, you can leave a link in a comment, and uh, also if you know of a great video on mag loops that people should watch, uh, put a link in a comment and uh, share with others. So that's part one. I hope to see you in part two. If uh, you got anything out of that video, uh, you could help me by clicking that uh, like button. And if you don't want to miss the uh, next video, be sure and subscribe. And in the meantime, you could watch these two videos.